1989, Tim Berners-Lee first proposed the World Wide Web project, and with it, he and his team at CERN invented HTTP and HTML. The first implementation had one HTTP method, and it was get. And every re response returned a HTML page. Years before the creation of JPEGs or Windows 3.1, with just HTTP and HTML, the first ever web page was deployed, and it was responsive. So the first version of HTTP was documented in 1991. With multiple versions and revisions over the next eight years in a period of rapid evolution until, it was, until HTTP 1.1 was finalized in 1999 and the modern internet was born. HTTP 1.1 is what most of us would know as HTTP 1 or what most websites run on at the moment. So I may use HTTP 1 or 1.1 interchangeably, but they're the same thing for the extent of this talk. In the preceding 20 years, generations of developers use these simple building blocks to create engaging experiences in communities for journalists, musicians, artists, designers, crafters, gamers, and everything in between. We went from 386s to Pentiums to watches with more computing power than the space shuttles that sent people to the moon. We added JavaScript, CSS, images, and most importantly, GIFs to our toolbox. And with them, we built new ways to connect, communicate, share in our lives, and engage with the world around us. The hypertext transfer protocol, although revolutionary for its time, is crumbling under the weight of our modern ambitions. The design of the protocol is at odds with what we as developers are building and with what our customers expect. In 1999, Google announced they were working internally on a modern revision of HTTP, and they named it Speedy. Speedy primarily focused on reducing latency, which as a result had large performance improvements over HTTP 1. Significant performance improvements drove rapid adoption of the new protocol in browsers and large sites like Facebook and Google. In 2012, looking to revitalize HTTP2 with a new, ver HTTP with a new version, a uh, working group took Speedy and made it the initial spec for HTTP2. The HTTP2 spec was finalized last year, and as of now, all major browsers and web servers support either HTTP2 or Speedy. Speedy. For better or for worse, uh, the story of HTTP2 has become tied to notions of free performance and how it make everything about web performance wrong. Unfortunately, the promise of free performance comes with some fine print, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So, uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm from Australia, and I'm a front-end performance engineer at 99 Designs. And as was said earlier, I'm one of the organizers of CSSConf and JSConf Australia, and I work on some open source projects you might be familiar with in Node, SAS, and LibSAS. Uh, and I want to start off by saying what this talk won't be about. This is not an intro to HTTP2. There's a lot of great material out there, a lot of great talks and blog posts that could do much better than I could in this time. What I will be talking about is some of the differences between HTTP1 and HTTP2, and what this can mean for performance. I will quickly cover some fundamentals necessary to illustrate these differences. So if networking protocols and HTTP aren't your thing, don't worry, I'll get you covered. So let's jump right in. Um, all in all, HTTP is fairly simple. Uh, you connect to a server, and then with a small set of commands, you instruct the server to perform some action, and it responds. Uh, these actions are issued as HTTP methods in requests and metadata. The most common method uh, being the get method. We instruct the HTTP server to respond with the contents of a file at a certain path. Uh, this simple interaction is largely unchanged in the 25 years since Tim Berners-Lee created HTML, or HTTP. There are a bunch of other methods uh, that I won't cover today, but for the most part, it boils down to a client, in our case, a browser, connects to a server and requests something with metadata and a method, and the server responds with content, uh, something like CSS, HTML, or JavaScript. Underlying all this is our TCP IP. This is the primary networking protocol for all HTTP communication and for the internet in general. Uh, it's with this, it's with these two protocols, TCP and IP, that the two remote servers are able to communicate and exchange information efficiently. Being that it is the primary network protocol underpinning most of the internet, uh, it's an integral part of what networking performance is like on the internet. So we'll cover that a bit. Uh, one of the important things of TCP IP is the connection, and that involves a three-way handshake. Essentially, a client, say your a uh, browser will, set, will connect to a server and say, hey, here I am with a SYN packet. 
and the browser will say, here I am, I see you, with a synac packet, and the client will be like, I see you. And then they start communicating. Uh, the details of this aren't particularly important. The important thing to take away from this is that it takes a full networking round trip from you to the server on the server back to you before you can exchange any information. So we look at the anatomy of a request for a page, say the index HTML page. First, a uh, client, say the browser, connects to a server, they do a handshake, that's one round trip, and then the browser can say, hey, give me index.html. That goes to the server, the server does some work, generates the page, whether it be WordPress or a static file, then returns a response, in this case HTML, and that connection is closed. If in that response HTML, there was a link to a CSS file, that process starts again. You find the server, you handshake, you then request the server for a thing, the server does some work and returns it to you, and that connection is closed. So this is four round trips in total to ask for a HTML file and a CSS file. And this is, this is important because one of the uh, fundamental things of TCP and why it is so reliable is that it is a FIFO queue, so first in, first out. So the first thing a server sends to you must be the first thing you receive and you, rece and you read them in order. If for some reason along the way, due to congestion or happenstance, one of the, one of the packets of data is dropped on the floor, all sequential packets are just held by, this, by the client and buffered and not read until we're able to tell the server that, hey, we missed something, please resend it. And then it receives that and then reads the rest, computes the rest of the data. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's really what we need for this talk. Um, and this all happens at a layer well below anything we see. This is a networking layer, in, often in your OS or in your browser. And so we have no control over it in our code. And the end result is that things feel slow. Um, another impact of TCP, or another feature of TCP, is congestion control. This is necessary because over the internet, there's many different uh, bandwidths. And between you and the server communicating to, is intermediate proxies, uh, many different computers and servers, all those at different bandwidths, and amplify that across the entire world, you can get into a case where people are communicating at different speeds and packets start uh, backing up, and you start dropping packets. And as soon as you start dropping packets, the server has to retransmit those packets. That causes more congestion, causing you to drop more packets, causing you more, re more, more retransmits and more congestion, and it can go on, on to the point it can cripple entire networks and has in the past. So as a result, uh, congestion controls start with sending a really small window saying, I'm going to send you a little bit, and then the longer the connection lives on, the more it will send, kind of a test to see where the capabilities of that bandwidth are. And that's interesting, because you end up in this property of uh, TCP where most internet connect communication is latency bound. An experiment done at Google a couple years ago, or well, probably a while ago now, um, showed that with increases in bandwidth, Start, show, start showing diminishing returns once you about five megabits per second. But, increase, but decreases in latency have a, have a linear increase over time. So the, the more you can shrink down latency, the faster things get. And this is due to the fact that everything requires you know, a back and forth round trip and the handshake must happen. Uh, so one of the things brought into HP 1.1 was the idea of a keep alive in that you can connect to a server and keep that connection open for multiple requests. So you still got a request in order, you sort of say, please give me the HTML file, now please give me the CSS file, but you save yourself that extra round trip in every connection each time you need a new file, until eventually one of the, one of the, either the client or the server says, okay, I'm done, close the connection. And HTTP 1.1 also tried to bring in this idea of pipelining, extending the keep alive, keeping a connection over, but saying, hey, I know I need these three files, give me these three files. Uh, at once, and this runs into the head of, head of line problem in that the server must respond with one, with one of the files, generally the first file you send, but always packs that received in order. So you can't intermix sending those files, they must be sent in order, so you kind of lose a lot of the benefits of, use a lot of the benefits of what you'd expect in this, because you can't multiplex. Um, so this actually did have a lot of benefits in a lot of cases, but it proved really hard to do well. And there were uh, classic cases in Safari where you would mix up the file name you requested with the actual body, causing images to show in the wrong areas. And intermediary proxies in the world, of which there are many, would understand these properly and mix up response and garbled responses. So 
although it actually has a lot of benefits, it's hard to do well, and there's a lot of bad actors in the world out there that get in the way of it. So most browsers and servers will support this, but by default it's turned off and considered an advanced feature. Uh, and keeping these, with these things in mind, you can see where, where our common best performance practices come from. Things like concatenation, spriting, inlining, and domain sharding are all ways to work around opening more connections and doing more handshakes and uh, avoiding latency. And since this critical path is a way of working around congestion control, in the, the idea being you put C inline CSS into, the, into your page, but only put enough in so you can fit within that first window while TCP is still testing your connection. So this is where HTTP2 comes in. HTTP2, like uh, Keep Alive's and pipelining before it, was designed to reducing latency using long-lived connections. But something it does differently is this idea of streams, in that you have one connection to a server, but within that connection, you have multiple streams. So this is like an analogy of car lanes on a highway. You have a highway to a server, multiple lanes of communication, independent from each other, but they're bidirectional. So I can ask, I can ask for three files at the same time on one stream and get those responses back on that stream, completely separate from another stream which is requesting JavaScript. And what it has over pipelining is the idea of multiplexing. So as I request three CSS files, the server can respond to those files in any order and in bits of pieces. So I can get the headers for one file, get the headers for another file, and it's part of its content. And then after that, the next packet could be the content of a different file. And this is baked into the protocol so the servers and clients understand how to reassemble these things. And each one of these packets here is, what, is what's called the frame. Uh, we're not going to dig into frames too much for this. So as you can see, with multiplexing and uh, long-lived connections and streams, we're reducing a lot of the problems with bandwidth and working around a lot of the issues with con congestion control being lots of tiny requests. By having one long-lived request, we get larger congestion control windows, we get to flow more data more freely. And this is why people are telling us that uh, everything without performance is wrong. You don't need to worry about latency, don't need to worry about congestion windows. You know, bandwidth is free, and latency is not a problem. And I took this, uh, the, the research on the internet is all in this behavior. There's very little bad to be said about HTTP. So with this confidence, uh, we started moving towards HTTP2 at 99designs. Um, and before, switch, before flicking the switch on this, I uh, confidently said to my, C, to my boss that it couldn't possibly be any slower, we're fine. To my chagrin, uh, we rapidly started seeing decreases. Uh, we, we soon saw decreases in site performance. Uh, so this next, say, 15 minutes of my talk is me systematically eating my own hat. Uh, so I work for 99designs. We're a, a crowdsourced graphics design marketplace, which is purely to say that images are very important. We have lots and lots of images. And to measure our site performance, we pick some key metrics. Uh, we focus more on perceived performance from the user, so we use a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, these are the dashboards that float around our office. Um, so we look at content, DOM content loaded uh, to determine if synchronous scripts are delaying our page loads. Uh, we look at the first paint to see if, delay, if rendering is being delayed by fonts or CSS. Um, we look at time to visually complete uh, to look at non-render non blocking resources like images and asynchronous scripts. And one of our main proxies at a glance is speed index, which gives us a good idea of visual completion over time. Are sites being drawn faster? Are they finishing faster? Uh, and visual completion is mostly concerned with what's above the viewport. So in your initial view, does the site feel look like it loaded fast? And to gather a lot of this data, we use uh, an app called Calibre, a service called Calibre, and we fetch the data out and store it locally. So before I get into some of the problems with HTTP2, we did see some great improvements. Um, Pages like our designer portfolios, which are a typical, representative of a typical page on our site, you know, they're mostly latency bound, lots of really small files need to be pulled down, uh, lots of really small images. And for these pages, uh, we saw like a 5% improvement on speed index. So pages looked like they were drawing faster. Uh, the time to first paint was comparable, so the first paint would happen around the same time in HTTP1 versus HTTP2, but the page would finish drawing faster. Uh, interesting, inter more interestingly was the uh, initial render, the first draw on the page, uh, was more complete HTTP2, which you'd expect as you should be getting more data at the same time. 
One of the bad things, and the thing that really stuck out to us, was our designer galleries. Uh, these are extremely Emmy heavy pages, so between 80 pages on average, and a page can be anywhere between 500 to, uh, 5 to 10 megs uh, of images. And these pages are bam bandwidth bound, not uh, latency bound. So because they weren't latency bound, we didn't expect that the reduction in latency would have much impact on the performance of these pages. Uh, we actually saw a 5 to 10 percent uh, faster time to visual completion speed index, oh, sorry, slower. So these pages would finish drawing much slower in HTTP2 than HTTP1. But we did see faster page load times, which suggests that the reduced latency was having an effect, which was very counterintuitive to us. We also did some high latency testing because mobile is important to us and to everybody. Uh, for this, we use web page tests. And compared to HTTP1, uh, HTTP2 continued to have more complete first paints, so more data was getting there sooner, and we're drawing more complete the very first thing the user saw. Uh, but they did happen noticeably later. So the first paint would happen much before, much later than the um, HTTP1 paints, but they'd be way more complete. Uh, and we were continually seeing faster page loads, so all the data was getting to the user fa faster eventually, but we were seeing much slower time to draw the page completely. Uh, so to kind of sum that up, for a typical page full of images on our site, ones were latency bound, lots of small files, a lot of small images, uh, we were seeing a 5% faster time to visually complete the entire page. Uh, but for extremely image hedge pages, pages that were latency bound, pages that did a lot of work and transferred a lot of data, we actually saw much slower uh, visual completion, somewhere between 5 to 10% slower than previously. And on high latency connections uh, with low speed, say, mobile networks, uh, we saw greater delays in reaching visual completion. But in all tests, the initial paints were more complete, even though they happened much later. Uh, so to summarize, uh, bandwidth bound pages was significantly longer to reach visual completion despite loading way faster. And we couldn't figure out why initially. This was unexpected to us. So our first hypothesis was network saturation. It could it be that requesting so many things at once and having a single connection that could multiplex, was that draining, uh, was that draining resources away from other things on the page, like CSS and JavaScript, that would actually block the rendering of the page? You know, in your typical HTTP1 water flow, you see things are staged. Uh, so things that happen earlier in the page tend to be loaded earlier, and you get a good distribution of bandwidth across your requests. So looking at these network waterfalls, we couldn't actually see that happening. You know, CSS was loading when CSS should load, JavaScript loading when JavaScript should load, images loading when images should load, and they seem to be loading and finishing at the same time. So our next hypothesis was loading priority. In HTTP 1, you have this limit of six open connections per host. Uh, and this creates that first in, first out queue I was talking about, where the first thing in your page tends to be the first thing requested and the first thing responded to, then things happen in order. Uh, as a result, the relation of things in your document, document tend to be the relation of things will load. So you have some control over the loading order of things. Um, with HTTP 2, it's a, it allows mul multiple requests and responses over the one connection happened at the exact same time. Uh, as a result, we don't really get that priority anymore. Everything it sees, you get asked for at the same time, and says, so just give me what you got, and I'll figure it out. And you kind of lose control of like, what should be loaded first, what should be loaded last, uh, what things are more important than others. Uh, so the browsers do have built-in prioritization for this, but you lose control in your, document, in your document. So it could very well be that images at the bottom of the page were given the same priority as images on top of the page, causing those uh, longer times visual completion. Uh, so part of this, we'd considered that putting the best practice of putting scripts at the bottom of our pages was causing those scripts to get like a higher priority and actually pushing off image loading resources. But we were able to figure out that this wasn't the case. Because um, don't complete loaded at the same time and don't complete be blocked on these JavaScript files. So by that being in the same place and us monitoring that, we could tell that the priority of these scripts weren't being moved and you weren't changing the render properties of the page. So it kind of came down to something happening at the network layer. Things just weren't coming to us the way we expected to as fast as we could come. 
Um, so this brings us to the idea of resource priority. Uh, in practice, the browser's download queue is prioritized. Uh, so starting adding, adding image requests before finding script at the bottom of the page doesn't delay script loading at all. The exact loading behavior and resource is undocumented. However, it constantly changes. So part of the problem is that browsers have their own heuristics in how they load things. But typically, images have very low priority. Things like fonts and JavaScript have a higher priority. And one of the interesting things about these browser heuristics, they were developed by browser vendors over time to suit the current trends. So an interesting one now is the hero image heuristic. So all the images get a very low priority. Uh, browsers will find the first image in the page and make it a very high priority. The idea being that a lot of sites have this big hero image, and that should load first, and given the same priority as CSS and JavaScript. So knowing that these heuristics are in play, uh, we want to look at the stream. Without that limit of six connections per server, we get HTTP 1. We could see 80 image requests all firing at once to the server. And the server would then respond to them simultaneously, because they wouldn't know which was more important than the other. And the browser would draw them as they came in. Uh, this had an interesting effect, and we'd see something like this. Comparing HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, we'd see that the HTTP 1 page was drawing this image on the far image much slower, which meant that it was getting the packets uh, much slower. But we knew that these pages were finishing to load generally much faster, which led us into the area that led us down the track of thinking that there was some sort of bandwidth contention and that the browser was treating all images equally. So there were images much further down the page that were being rendered. And part of this problem comes down to is if all images are the same size and the bandwidth is distributed equally, they should all load equally. And this page would have been faster. But in this case, this image on the right is slightly larger than the two on the left. And as a result, it has a different, uh, it requires more data and is then drawn differently, has different loading characteristics. And because the bandwidth is being distributed to page, images off the page, we see this kind of uh, phased loading, much slower than HTTP 1, which had a baked in priority saying this image is more important than images down the bottom of the page. Um, so there is some fine print uh, with HTTP 2 that not many people are talking about. Um, and Ilya Gregoric of the Chrome team uh, said this really well. Uh, with HTTP 2, the browser relies on the server to deliver the responses in optimal way. It's not just the number of bytes or requests per second, but the order in which the bytes are delivered. You need to test implementation carefully. The, these loading heuristics that exist are undocumented, and they're undocumented on purpose. The idea is that browser vendors can choose what heuristics work better for their customers in their environments. They can analyze data, and they know better. And they differ between versions. A change in a heuristic in a version can actually improve certain sites, but significantly affect other sites. And they're not documented, and they're not told about these things. And they have to be general for all sites. So what is good for a site with a big hero image may not be good for a site that is an app or a single page app. And these are concerns that have got to be balanced. So HTTP2 took this shift, and it says, as a developer, on your site, you know it's best for your site. And it changed the landscape of resource prioritization. The responsibility is now shared between the browser and the server. The browser gives the server hints on like this stream. So it knows the stream is serving images and says, this stream has a priority much lower than the priority of the stream serving CSS. And that is lower than the stream serving JavaScript. Uh, that's an option the browser has. Whether it works that way is uh, different, and most streams tend to be the same for the, for the time being. This is changing between browsers. Uh, but the, the server can ignore that. The server can just say, actually, I know that on this page, we have lots of images. So these get a higher priority than the JavaScript that affects a button at the bottom of the page. And you can build that control into your own server. In practice, this is much harder, because you tend to use a CDN and don't own these servers yourself. But if you run your own HTTP servers, you can build in your own heuristics. And it's an option you now have, that you didn't have with HTTP 1. But this ends up being a double-edged sword. Um, resource prioritization existing in both the client and the server uh, can really muddy the waters and open up uh, way more problems we weren't aware of. And put, but it does give the ability to put the developer in charge. And the developer who knows their site can do really great things. Uh, and I previously hinted at the idea of weights. And a weight is a hint the browser gives at priority. This happens in HTTP 1, where the browser uses the idea of priority to then determine what order to send requests in. In HTTP 2, we send all requests at the same time, but we apply a weight signifying its priority. 
something with a lower weight has less priority and should get less bandwidth than something of a higher weight. So images versus CSS versus fonts or JavaScript. The browser can assign these different streams and different weights and saying these are more important than others. Uh, the server is free to ignore all of that. Um, and if you don't control your server, it's on you to test and see what your server is actually doing. Um, and dependencies. So dependencies are interesting and are one of the big things of HTTP2 streams in that we can say that although something is important, it's only important if its parent has already loaded. So this allows you to say that here are all the JavaScript files on my site, but don't bother loading anything until you've loaded jQuery. Or here are all the images on my site, but these three at the top of the page are way more important than the three at the bottom of the page. And you can describe this with dependencies. Uh, so some of the takeaways from our investigation was simply that there's no such thing as free performance. And this is something our browser vendors have known for a very long time. Web performance is a series of trade-offs and nuance. Image-heavy image pages uh, tend to prefer HTTP2 connections only when the ba total bandwidth is less than the latency incurred. If your, if, your if, your bandwidth, if your bandwidth is less than the latency you would have incurred, then you gain a lot by having a single long-lived connection. If you're very bandwidth heavy, reducing latency doesn't actually save you that much. So it's the right mix of high latency and low bandwidth that you can see really big gains. And these are the sites with lots of small CSS files, and lots of small images. Another thing to take away from this is that HTTP2 is very new. And the surface area for the protocol is huge. You have resource weight prioritization. You have resource dependency prioritization. You have multiplisting heuristics. And you have stream and connection flows. These things, although the implementation is documented, the heuristics aren't. It's really free to you as uh, developers for sites, people who are building servers, CDN owners. It's on all of you to figure out what is best for your situation or for your audience. Uh, and, hope, and there is work in browsers coming through to hint at these. So for you, in markup or in JavaScript, be able to say these resources are more important than others and have some control over that, although that appears to be a while off just yet. And there are other glaring issues with HTTP2 that make this really hard. One is the lack of visibility. HTTP2, unlike HTTP1, is a binary protocol. It's no longer clear text over the wire. You can't just look at what's happening. It requires specialized tools. And because it all happens over SSL, it requires either man in middle your connection or doing it manually via some sort of CLI that gives you access to emulate a browser. Um, and dev tools simply haven't caught up here. Uh, they have the information. But it's very hard to show to show in the dev console. You know, our minds are programmed, our experience is being programmed to waterfalls of HTTP 1. That doesn't really apply in HTTP 2 anymore. And as a while, all the tools are still catching up. For a long time, tools were reporting uh, connection times being wrong because of the way they intercepted SSL. And these issues are abound. And as I mentioned, the binary protocol makes it, easy, makes it very hard to sniff at what's happening. Um, you can no longer have a good intuition of. What's, what's, being, what's being sent, you, can no longer, you can't easily inspect the heuristics at play. You can't see if a server is prioritizing something over something else, what order the packets are coming in. Uh, and that's multiplexing behavior can be really important and have really subtle effects. Uh, so there are some great resources in this area. Uh, HTTP2 101 is a quick video by Soma. Um, high, performance, high performance browser networking is a must read for anyone who work in site performance, or you care about site performance. Ilya Gregorica, the Chrome team, covers a lot of this material in way more detail and is responsible for much of the material in the beginning of this talk. Uh, HTTP2 here is less optimized, is a, a one hour long talk by Ilya Gregoric. It's definitely worth watching, but it's very in depth. Uh, HTTP 1.5, HTTP2 and 1.5 world by Peter Wilson. This is a great talk on not jumping on the HTTP2 train just yet and some of the trade offs and keeping in mind that many of our users are still on HTTP 1 and will be for the foreseeable future. And this is a blog post I wrote that goes into um, many, of the, many of the things we ran into stream with HTTP 2 in more detail, uh, and some more waterfalls and some of the conclusions we came to. Uh, and thank you. That is the wrong one.